Welcome to our 50th episode of Wonder Space. It's great to have you on board. My name is Steve Cole, and over the past 15 months, I have been asking the same six questions to amazing people from around the world. The questions orbit around wonders of the natural world and stories of hopefulness. Ask Nature, who are part of the Biomimicry Institute, are once again going to help us to rewonder. How does the down from the eight ducts provide so much warmth? In a way, it doesn't. It's all about the air surrounding it. All feathers have a central stem and many rows of long barbs, which in turn have tiny barbules branching off of them. Short down feathers have long barbs that tangle into a mass-like knotted hair. The tiny barbules grab each other and allow the knot to bounce back into shape, even if flattened. This fluffy bundle becomes a trap for air, preventing heat from easily moving from one side of the downy layer to the other. To mark our 50th episode, we would like to take you on a journey of hopefulness across six continents. We are going to zoom into some of the people, projects and organisations that our guests chose as their story of hopefulness. This wonder space orbit will take us over Madrid, the host city of COP25, and will finish over Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, which will host COP27. To experience these views with us in this ultimate window seat, we welcome John Elkington. John is a world authority on corporate responsibility and sustainable development. He is an advisor to global business and the author of 20 books. 
John is also playing a key role at COP26 in Glasgow this week, which you will hear about as part of his story. I start by asking John if we could do a fly past on any part of the world that is significant to you, which place, city or country would it be and why? Well, so many options, but when I first saw that question, when you sent it through, what came to mind was um, probably about 15 years ago, going to a a now much blighted country, which is Syria, and suddenly um, finding myself on a cliff overlooking the Euphrates, alongside a a, a, a ruinous city called Europa. And as I arrived, on the cliff edge, extraordinarily colourful birds just exploded from beneath my feet and flew down across the Euphrates. And that may not sound uh, particularly magical, but it was. And then when I came back, I found that uh, my genes, I had my genomics tested, um, largely come from Mesopotamia. So maybe that's why I had such a powerful uh, reaction. So probably that would be uh, a good choice. So I've struggled throughout my life to explain exactly what I am. Uh, you know, it could have been environmentalist, it could have been all sorts of different things, but um, started very early when I was 11 in 1961, raising money for the World Wildlife Fund in its first year. Then through the 70s and 80s, I, I increasingly worked with businesses, initially reporting on what business was doing and then getting closer in and working, particularly with boards and c suite Uh, folk Um, and being provocative in the sense not being a standard drop-in advisor you know indistinguishable from anyone else I mean Greenpeace I don't know 20 years ago described what I did as Greenpeace and pinstripes which has always been a a phrase which I quite liked and another one that was used more or less around the same time was grit in the corporate oyster in the sense that you're an irritant and if the if the corporate Uh, entity you're working with can spit you out, it probably will do. Um, But if you can stay in there, then new forms of value uh, are created. So in in, in having set up three prior social enterprises since 1978, in 2008, I set up a new one called Volance. Um, The idea was to push for system change and, and try and develop the business role in that. I've always avoided uh, the COP meetings. I've tended to go to the business uh, build-up events before them. But this year, for the first time, I'm going uh, to COP26. And, and part of the reason is not only just get a reading of what's going on um, there, but to try and push that systemic change um, a, a, a agenda. And um, one of the things I'm doing there is, is moderating a, a session with... Um, several CEOs, Unilever, Solvay, Ikea, and so on. And the, the theme is um, what's beyond net zero. So at a time when most companies are struggling to sort of think, oh, by 2040, 2050, 2060, we'll get to net zero. We're saying, fine, let's just take that for granted. And now what's next? So I'm quite looking forward to that one. just to be asleep. I mean, I, I've been tired since I was born, literally. And, and so uh, any moment I can grab on a plane or wherever it is in the days when we used to fly, I will sleep. But also I find the natural world, almost regardless of where one happens to be, incredibly um, recharging. And then quiet places. I even have uh, probably antibodies to organize religion but if i can find a small chapel or some some place like that 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 has centuries of people coming uh, together often an extremist but together i find those places sort of um, uh, recharge uh, me as well I, I suppose if I had to ask, answer the question with just one thing about the natural world which I find um, inspiring, it's migrations. And you think about the migration of our species around the world, you think about 
um, all sorts of animals uh, doing it and how over time those migratory uh, pathways have become longer and longer uh, typically and yet now we learn that many birds I'm, I'm based in the UK many birds are choosing to stay over the winter because it's not much of a winter any longer because of climate change so maybe some of these migratory pathways will be um, cut short truncated in a way like sort of our supply chains are as deglobalization uh, swings in but I think I think it would be that whole process of getting from A to a very distant B migration My story of hopefulness, probably for the moment, is the Earthshot Prize. And um, one of the um, teams that won this year, the first year, was uh, Coral Vita, uh, which is, um, and I bumped into one of the founders in Germany some years ago. We went, we spent uh, a whole day filming together in a freezing, um, coal-fired power station. Well, it was no longer, it was a coal mine and it linked to power stations. But um, I, I really loved what they were trying to do. And what they're trying to do is to restore coral reefs around the uh, world. So um, breeding uh, coral organisms that are resistant to rising temperatures, uh, rising acidity uh, in the uh, world uh, ocean. I wish we hadn't didn't have to do that. Uh, but the fact now that we're largely pushing uh, coral reefs towards extinction suggests that the work of people like Coral Vita is going to be incredibly important. So that the people would have that sort of level uh, of ambition and that sort of vision to sort of take these vast great living ecosystems and turn them back onto a healthy track. Yeah, it's, it's people like that that uh, I find uh, are a bit like a shot in the arm. Well, it's funny, uh, mentioning the Earthshot Prize, uh, Prince William critiqued people like Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson and Elon Musk for uh, piling into space. Uh, I, I, one of the things I've always um, felt was quite important was that overview effect that so many of the astronauts, so many of the cosmonauts, and one member of our advisory board since we founded Valance uh, was both a cosmonaut and uh, an astronaut, uh, Jerry Lininger, that people came back transformed. And so there's some part of me that's felt for quite some time now, it's actually a good thing to blast billionaires and multi-millionaires up into space if they come back transformed and if they then start to invest uh, their capital and their wealth in some of the things that we all know we should actually be doing. So I don't think these, this is either or. We either save Earth or we uh, blast ourselves up into space. I mean, done in the right way. I think the overview effect can actually be a very powerful ally. More about the work of John can be found at johnelkington.com. John is also founder and chief pollinator at Volans, which can be found at volans.com. To engage with the previous 49 Wonder Space episodes, go to our website, ourwonder.space. I want to thank John for being our guest this week. I would also like to thank everyone who has contributed into the making of 50 episodes, especially designer and producer Dan Potter and my son Sam who edits the episodes into shape. We have exciting guests lined up over the coming weeks and months, and in the new year, we will hopefully be in a position to share the more expansive vision of Wonder Space. In the meantime, let's continue to rewonder and share our stories of hopefulness. <laughs>